so this talk today is uh, going to be about the 12 or a little bit more OGC and ISO standard and the way that we implement them in uh, talking mostly about Apache SIS, but I will also give a, a few notes about two other implementations, which is Proj and the UCAR library and how they can uh, work together, how those three libraries can work together. So a quick note on the international organization first. OGC is uh, a not-for-profit international uh, organization. It's pretty much the leader of uh, geospatial standard now. The ISO defines international standard for geographic information as well, but many ISO standards are actually OGC standards that get adopted. So OGC and ISO often work together on the standard. Uh, the ISO standards are available for a fee on their website, but in many cases, the same standard is available on OGC website for free. They are the same content, just the cover page that is different and the, uh, the document formatting. Are the standards that I am going to talk today, even if I use the ISO number, they are also available as OGC standard. The only exception is metadata, which is uh, ISO only. All other standards, as far as I know, are both ISO and OGC standard. I am also going to talk to, uh, to mention those projects in this talk. Uh, Joe API is uh, a set of uh, implementation neutral interface uh, the three other projects I will talk today, Apache, Proj, and Yoka Library, implement at least a few of Joe API interface, uh, not sometimes directly, sometimes not, sometimes only with, with a wrapper. So all those projects will be mentioned today. I will classify the standard in, uh, in three categories. This is my personal classification. I don't think that OGC uh, formally use this classification. So as the basis of every kind of standard at uh, OGC, there is, in my point of view, the abstract specification. They are the specification that uh, define the concept using unified modeling language. The abstract specification are implementation neutral, not only uh, Vandar, but also the language, the programming language, the uh, encoding, format encoding, whether we are using the web or other technology, it's the most neutral thing that we have. And then there is what was called some year ago, implementation specification, which take the abstract specification and apply that to some more specific context. So it may be web services. I see web services as a kind of implementation specification where the implementation here is the web environment for the web environment. So I am not going to talk about web services uh, today. There is other talk that are doing that much better that I can do. Encoding, like uh, file format, GeoCIF and CDF could also be seen as, in some case, as uh, an implementation of uh, abstract specification. It's not really true for GeoCIF and NCDF but it's true for uh, WKT, uh, for example, the well-known text. I am going to tell more about that. And then we can have implementation in specific language like Java or Python. OGC, uh, Joe API is an OGC standard. It's an implementation specification which translates the abstract specification into Java. And we also started to do Python interface. The interface that uh, the standard that we are implementing right now are shown in this uh, slide, the, the main one. So uh, it's an implementation from the point of view of abstract specification because we target some specific language, Java or Python. Uh, it's implementation neutral and that is only interface, no code doing the actual work. A first abstract specification is uh, metadata. Uh, it may be the most basic one because all other specifications that I am going to talk today are built on top or directly or indirectly 
on top of metadata. So there is about uh, 150 interface. This UML is only showing a few of them, the UML on the left, uh, a few of the interface that we have in metadata. We use that for answering questions like who produced the data, where, uh, where is my data, what is the quality about the data, what is the content, what time, and things like that. Uh, the box on the right side show also metadata, more or less the same than in the left, but just showing that in a different way to see uh, which box contains uh, what information. So there is a basic set of metadata, which is ISO 19115 1, and there is some extension dash 2 and uh, ISO 19157 which are for uh, giving more information about acquisition, how the metadata was uh, collected, how the data was collected, which instrument on which platform, and what is the quality of those data? Do they are complete? Do they are consistent? Those metadata can be uh, exchanged in an XML format, which is defined by yet another standard this time an encoding standard. So ISO 19115-3 can be seen as a kind of implementation standard uh, if we take the definition that I gave a few minutes ago. It takes the abstract specification and uh, represent that in one format, in this case, XML. So this is an example of what uh, look like uh, some a little bit of metadata in this format. How we can use that? A developer who uses Apache SIS can read uh, XML file using the code that I am showing there. So in this example, there is uh, at least uh, four or five stand, well, at least three standards at play. So there is the one that defines the XML format, and there is the one that defines the, uh, the concept, uh, the one that was the UML that we saw before the XML. Uh, this one defines the class and the, and the property, the getter method that the Java developer will use to access the information. The other standard depends on whether the metadata contains information about quality or not. And Joy API is the set of interface for uh, uh, accessing those metadata, uh, no matter what implementation I am using. So in this uh, snapshot, the only thing that is specific to Apache SIS is the text in green. Everything in blue comes from Joe API. It could be Apache SIS, or it could be the Yucca library, or it could be anything else, anything that implement the Joe API interface, a developer can access the metadata in the same way. Only the part in green will change depending on the implementation. So this is an example uh, with two different implementations. Uh, this one is a little bit different. This example are not reading a metadata XML file. Instead, they are reading a data, a full set of data. Uh, in this example, this is a NetCDF file. And they ask, uh, please give me the metadata about this, uh, this set of data. The example on top is using uh, Apache SIS. The example on the bottom using the Yucca library. There is a wrapper uh, for Yucca library. I will give the link at the end of this presentation. Uh, the, those wrappers are not uh, very extensive uh, right now. They can be developed later, developed more later. But we already see that uh, we can get metadata called net reference system using those wrappers. And there is also an application, a JavaFX application, which is going to be available in the 1.1 release. Uh, by the way, uh, the 1.1 release, I hope, uh, will be next week. I was hoping to have it on time for this, for this uh, presentation, but I need more one, we need more one week. So uh, in this case, we load a file, and it, the metadata, the ISO metadata can be shown as a tribute uh, on the screen. The point there is that 
uh, no matter if the data are GeoTIFF or NetCDF or CSV or uh, anything, uh, we get the same uh, the same tree. The, the node is organized according to the metadata conceptual model. So we can see on the top uh, the geographic information metadata where it comes from. Uh, Apache SIS managed backward compatibility because the old standard, the standard metadata standard has been reviewed uh, seven years ago, but the old one is still in wide use, uh, especially regarding how we describe who uh, created the data, who maintained the data. There was quite a significant change. So Apache SIS take care of uh, when we invoke a method from the old standard, it forward uh, automatically to uh, the new method. So the developer, the user don't need to care about whether they are using the old or the new version of the standard. Now, another important standard uh, is the one for referencing by coordinate. So again, I am showing on the left only uh, in the UML, only some of the class. There is many more. Uh, the key point is that uh, referencing is very complicated, much more than uh, we think intuitively. And the ISO standard and OGC standard as well do quite a good job of uh, trying to address this complexity. So uh, Apache SIS provide an implementation of the standard. Uh, the well-known text can also be seen as a kind of implementation of the standard. In this case, the implementation is how we represent that in a text format. So in this uh, slide, I am showing uh, the component of a coordinate reference system definition, a three-dimensional one, having a projected, uh, a map projection, and uh, a height and metadata saying uh, where this projection is uh, is suitable. Another standard is how we represent the same information but in XML. It's not as much used as uh, WQT now. Uh, well, it still exists, but I think that now WQT is the main one used for representing a CRS. And again, again, how we get a definition uh, from a programming language. Again, I am showing how we do the same operation with two different implementations. So Proj is a very well-known library in C, C++ for a map projection. And there is a wrapper for uh, using Proj in Java. So this is the Proj GNI project. The link will be at the end of the presentation. Apache SIS is a pure Java implementation. But again, uh, no matter which implementation we use, except for just a starting point, which is in green in this slide, after we got the starting point, everything else is the same. So a developer can write the same code with uh, very few concerns about which implementation they are using. I am not showing coordinate transformation uh, in this slide, but uh, we can get the idea. This is another example using Apache SIS again. So it's a three different way to get a coordinate reference system definition from an APHE code, a well no text format, or a GML. Referencing by identifier, uh, it's another way to provide a definition of coordinate. I am not showing the UML uh, in this slide, just uh, giving the idea. Uh, the idea is to use a series, a text, or a mix of a text and number to represent a coordinate. So GeoH is a, a very simple way to do that. MGRS, Military Grid Reference System, is much more difficult, but uh, it also addresses some limitation of GeoH. For example, GeoH uh, is much longer than necessary. It's not very suitable for the pole, for example. Uh, the military grid reference system is a kind of extension of uh, universal transverse mercator projection, 
but also designed to work well uh, on the North Pole and South Pole. Now, uh, everything I said before could be seen as kind of metadata. Even CRS can be seen as a specialized kind of metadata. Now we are talking about the data directly. Uh, so there is this thing that we call a feature at OGC and uh, in, in various projects. And I think there is a bit of confusion about what a feature is. So uh, my point of view is that a feature is not a geometry. Uh, Sometimes we see the word feature use feature and geometry use as if they were the same thing. It's not a feature contains a geometry, but it's not a geometry. There is a bit of confusion maybe because the name of the standard, of some standard, give the impression that it is the same thing. But there is also other standard, in, the, in particular ISO 19109, that uh, uh, give a definition, a wider definition of a feature in which a geometry is only a part. So if we make a comparison with a database, a feature instance would be a row in a table, and the geometry would be one or some of the column in the, in the database. Uh, so there is also uh, UML for that. The UML come from ISO 19109. But the way to translate that in a programming language depends a lot of the programming language in this case. The way to do is totally different depending if we target Java or Python because of the dynamic nature of Python. Uh, def to define a feature is basically like defining a class, a Java class on the fly, for example. So those things can be done more directly in Python than in a type of language like Java. So after we have the, something equivalent to a table in a database, how do we specify which data do we want? So now there is yet another standard for that, which is uh, ISO 19143, which is used to, to encode a filtering. This specification is a little bit unusual compared to the other one I said, uh, showed just before, because it's mixed abstract and encoding standard. Well, for this presentation, we can just uh, look at the UML. So again, I am showing there only uh, some of the UML, it's not the full specification, which they, uh, which they find how to express a filter for specifying where we want the data, uh, this is a spatial operator, or when we want uh, the data, the temporal operator, and then some operator for uh, making combination, the usual and or not operator and stuff like that. In the in API interface, uh, the interface has uh, been made a little bit different than the way they are specified in the ISO standard to improve the compatibility with Java Stream API. So this is one reason why uh, at some point in the past, uh, some people wanted to have tools for translating automatically ISO specification to Java interface. I think that hum human intervention is always necessary. This is an example where uh, I think it was useful to apply manner change to gain a compatibility with the Java Stream API. Other uh, imp uh, standard implemented by uh, uh, the Apache SIS project is reading NetCDF and GeoC format. So there is not much to say about NetCDF. It's an encoding format. But again, the important thing is that uh, when we read a NetCDF file using Apache SIS, at the end, after the decoding process, what we get is a object uh, represented by the standard that I have shown before. We get metadata, as shown before. We get coordinate reference system object, as we showed before. 
this slide is showing uh, the, yeah, the NetCDF, an NetCDF file in the Apache SIS uh, viewer. By the way, uh, this viewer is only in early stage. I hope that next version we will give it much more capability. But we can see already on the bottom of the screen feature like uh, basic feature like having the coordinate, the value under the cursor. In this case, it is a sea surface temperature. So we have temperature in Celsius degree, the usual possibility to control the color palette and things like that. GeoTIF, a screenshot will be basically the same thing that what we saw before, so I am not showing. Just making a comparison uh, of uh, why we have sphere and format and what are the pro and con of uh, each format. So each format have a strong point and a weaker point. So GeoTIF is very good for uh, visualization. It's a little bit more difficult for scientific data. It can be used for scientific data, but it's not as natural as NetCDF, for example. NetCDF, this is the complete opposite. They are very good fit for scientific data, but not so good for visualization. So GeoTIF, for example, they have the color information in the file. If it is class optimized GeoTIF, they have a, a pyramid, which allow to zoom, zoom in, zoom out quickly. But uh, the, the way to get a scientific value, to convert a pixel to a scientific value, like a temperature, is not as well defined as in NetCDF, for example. It's two-dimensional. We are exploring uh, n-dimensional extension in the testbed. This work is done mostly by Evan from the JEDAL project. But uh, it's a kind of hack. A GeoTIF is not designed for n-dimensional. So again, it's possible to do n-dimensional data with GeoTIF, but it's not designed for that. It's not as natural as NetCDF. The, uh, a more in-deep comparison is more between GeoTIF and ZAR format, not as much between GeoTIF and NetCDF format, is underway at OGC. Uh, uh, engineering report will be published, I think it is in December or maybe soon after December, something like that, which will contain a comparison uh, more information about the uh, comparison between formats. In summary, uh, talking about the GeoAPI interface, this is some of the standards that uh, I talk about today. The package that implement them in GeoAPI, taking in mind that uh, some of those packages are uh, on the master branch of the OGC repository, but not yet released especially the thing about filter and feature. And we are also exploring, not released yet, but again, we have the code on the master branch. We are also exploring a Python uh, module for uh, the, same, uh, the same standard. And there is also a bridge between Java and Python that we are exploring. This is the link to uh, the project that I uh, 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 mentioned today. Is there any question? Martin, thank you very much. Um, yeah, let's watch uh, chat. If folks have questions there, uh, feel free to uh, put them in there. Um, I've, I've definitely got uh, a question or two. You mentioned uh, having uh, sort of uh, Python and Java uh, bindings worked out. Um, I, I've done most of my work on the JVM, so, uh, and I, I haven't worked with Python that much. Uh, do you have any particular, uh, are, what, what, can you say more about that uh, uh, bridge? Are you using Py4j, or I, I think there are some options there. I'm, I'm just curious. Yes, so the, br the bridge currently are using a project which is called GPY. It was, this, it, uh, it was a project from ESA, the European Space Agency. And this project was designed specifically with performance with big array in mind using XArray and uh, NumPy. So it was designed specifically with those projects uh, in mind. So we thought that it was a good uh, good bet, given that uh, we are going to handle large array. 
So GPY is using Java native interface GNI to communicate. But uh, there is a, a something new since a few years. Java has a project that they call Panama, which is a completely new way to, uh, uh, to interact between uh, C and uh, Java, which will hopefully make things much easier. So we did not release the bridge, the Java Python bridge yet. They are available on the master, not released yet. Uh, I would like pretty much to try to re-implement that using the Panama project. But the Panama project is still in incubation right now at uh, OpenGDK. Uh, not sure when they will be, uh, when will be the final release, but it's already uh, pretty much advanced. It already seems to be usable. Uh, by the way, uh, I mentioned GNI. The ODOL project, like uh, GNR, they work, but GNR is basically a GNI generator. Currently, except for Panama, currently the only way to bridge, to make a bridge between Java and C is GNI. There is no other way. All the other way, like GNR, they are actually GNI generator. They generate, they generate GNI code on the fly. Panama is a totally different way to address the same problem, which will remove completely the need to write uh, native code with GNI or to generate native code uh, with GNI. Very cool. Uh, that's the first I'd heard about uh, uh, Java, Java's Panama project. Um, and yeah, I mean, since I've worked in this space, uh, I've definitely heard of uh, libraries like Proj that have existed on, you know, that, that are written in C. And since I've worked in Java, there's always that. How do we use Proj? How do we use GDAL? Uh, so uh, thanks for mentioning that JNI is the way to do that. And also, it's really cool to hear that uh, Java is uh, making an improvement there to um, how things are done. Um, I wanted to give George a chance to ask a question, especially since uh, George has worked around uh, standards for um, most of his recent career. So, uh, and is also my uh, track co-chair. So, uh, George. Hey, thanks, Jim. Appreciate that, and uh, welcome, Martin. It's good to hear your voice. Uh, thanks. Question about um, you know, SIS has been a leader in. Um, uh, coordinate reference systems and, you know, changing between positions and the like and the metadata associated with them. And I'm wondering now, as additional to CRS, we've got discrete global grid systems, DGGS, that provide for the ability of location referencing. And I'm wondering if you're looking at that from an SIS point of view to uh, add any DGGS, discrete global grid systems capabilities to SIS. I would like to add it, but uh, I could not give any schedule for now. So that's something, it is on my wish list, but uh, the question when I will be able to do that for now, I don't know. And I guess maybe if there were people that uh, would contribute to SIS from a uh, DGGS capability, that might be welcome. Yes, sure. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Got a few other folks on the line. Uh, are there questions from others? You can uh, put it in the chat. I don't know that you have the ability to do audio. Uh, but certainly questions in the chat would be welcome for Martin. And uh, let me also um, mention in the chat right now, as we've got a minute here with the, uh, the track, I don't know how that came out, but we do have a mailing list at Apache. Apache supports an Apache-wide mailing list uh, called geospatial at apache.org. Actually, Martin might have started this right way back when. Um, and so you can sign up and join that mailing list. It's not uh, you know, um, a, a large amount of traffic, but it is a resource that has come in very handy on a variety of occasions to gain access to geospatial discussions in Apache, and anybody can join.
So Martin, since we have uh, another minute or two, um, you said that the um, uh, 1.1 uh, release is coming out soon. Uh, do you have any ideas of uh, what's next for Apache SIS after uh, the 1.1 1 .1 release? Uh, we still have to complete the Jotsif support. So what is making what is missing right now is the uh, use of, of HTTP range to download only the request part, and also using better IP Rebin information. A very important task that I would like to do is to upgrade the QualsNet reference system to the new ISO 19111 specification. Because right now we are implementing an impl the specification which is uh, uh, f between five and 10 years old. The new one uh, bring dynamic datum. So I did not talk about that today. Uh, my talk last year was talking about that. So dynamic datum uh, take in account the plate motion, plate motion, uh, earthquake and things like that. But uh, even if we are not interested in very small movement, I think that dynamic datum is still useful because I think it may be possible to use that for uh, sea level or things that uh, fluctuate with time, like uh, measurement using atmospheric pressure or measurement relative to sea level. So uh, a dynamic datum is on my to-do list. Also, the EPHG database, they have done a major relays uh, one year ago, which is... Uh, they changed the database format, so it will require change in the code base. They made that change uh, in depth because of uh, dynamic datum. So we need to upgrade to the new uh, that, uh, APHG data format, database schema. So it's a very important thing to do. And then after that, uh, there is the, the rendering work that we need to, to start the, render, the actual rendering of a map. So right now, uh, SIS is providing the data, but it's not doing rendering operation except very simple one for, uh, for restore data. So we will need a complete rendering engine, maybe the next year or next two years. Martin, it's good to hear you're adding the uh dynamic datums element. That's been a major activity over the past couple of years in the CRS community, as you know, of course, um, in order to address the moving plates of the earth, right? Uh, the one case that uh, always comes up there is Australia moving a meter every decade, something crazy. So if you're looking at uh, meter scale accuracy, uh, for your applications, then the addressing the dynamic datums um, is important to do. So I'm, I'm pleased to hear you're going to add that new part of the standard. Marco's got a question um, that's, you know, he asks, uh, can or should EPSG uh, be replaced in the future? And he's asking because of the licensing issues with it. Um, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that, Martin? I am not aware of anything that could replace the APHC. Uh, ISO is also building a, a judistic data set right now, but uh, it also has some licensing condition, license condition that looks like the APHC one. And uh, also, ISO is more like a provider of definition for APHC who make the, the distribution. So yes, we still have this uh, licensing issue with APHG, and I am not aware of any solution to that right now. One thing that uh, I am considering is that uh, I'd, maybe I would need to ask to APHG people, what happens if uh, a user, for example, don't take the full APHG database, but only pick up the four or five uh, definition that uh, he need for uh, his, his task. What are the license conditions in this case? So that's a question that I would like to ask to uh, APHG for. 
All right. Yeah, that that's a, a really good question. Um, I haven't uh, dug into the details much around uh, the EPSG uh, license issues. So, uh, and going back to what uh, George pointed out with the uh, uh, geospatial mailing list for the Apache Software Foundation, that might be a good place to um, for other people to share what they learned there or uh, whenever you figure it out, Martin, uh, let us all know on that mailing list uh, what the yes. answer is. Yes, I was used to post a, to ask the question at OGC meeting and to post a, a summary on the mailing list. But uh, since the meeting are virtual, uh, I contribute, uh, I become less involved in OGC meetings since they are virtual. I am waiting, hoping that they will become real again to get uh, more involved. I find it difficult to follow the, what, what is happening by, uh, by virtual meeting. We just need to get over COVID, right? That's all that's required. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, uh, here's hoping that that'll uh, that COVID will wrap up soon. Uh, that's our time. For